few short snippets that we can cut out and make small videos and then uh, spend a lot of time on order prints. Sort of my thought. What do y'all think about that? Awesome. Okay, so the last step I have to do. Okay, awesome. He is recording. All right, so one question I saw come up today, which is a uh, great problem to have, but is how to know when to quit when you're ahead, All right? So um, I know many of us are like, man, I wish I had that problem, but it's actually a really important question because so many traders are so focused on, you know, trying to win that when they finally actually start having, you know, profitable days, they don't know what to do, how to, you know, react to it. And more often than not, I would say more often than not, again, most traders have the problem of continuing to trade. And who can tell me what happens when you're up and you keep trading? What normally is the next result? Yeah, you give it back. So, you know, your inclination is, hey, I'm making money. I should just keep trading. Right? And that's that's what most people think. Yeah, they over trade. So let me adjust my camera. Yeah, timed application. Okay, so I'm doing the right thing. Set time interval. You get updated every uh, 0.2 seconds. Right, good. Yep, cameras on the right settings. Cam, you ought to be able to see the form now. Can you see the form? Okay, y'all can see the form? Okay. All right, I'm assuming if y'all can that he can as well. All right, so... One of the things that nobody wants to take time doing, I mean, when, when you get into trading and you learn about this new world of way that you can click buttons and make money and you don't have to advertise, you don't have to sell your friends on anything, um, you don't have to have a boss, then immediately you do what? You, you just want to hop in and trade, right? I mean, that's, that's what all of us want to do. Um, I don't know if y'all can see the hotcom camera, but there's a mute all section. If you just click that mute button, can y'all see that? I don't know if it, if hotcom hides itself. If it does, I'll take a picture. Then you'll be able to see the picture. There you go. So click that um, button right there to turn your audio on. I know you can't hear me, but. If somebody can type what I just said to Harmander, that would be great. Click the mute all button on Daryl's screen that he's showing you in the bottom left of Hotcom. Somebody type that for me to help him out. Um, so everybody wants to get in there and they want to trade and they want to make money. And I can't blame you, you know. Now, I want to tell you the path I took, and honestly, part of it was limited to I just didn't have the money to trade when I first started trading. Um, I went to – the company I work for took me to some um, – I don't know what it was, but some, like, get motivated seminar, you know, and they had all sorts of famous people up there. And But one of the guys was a trader and uh, was selling some $500 red-green arrow course. 
and we teach about options. And this is a new world I never heard of. My parents never taught me anything like that. I bought the course. I can say it was pretty overall worthless, but I can tell you that it got me on the right path. It got me intrigued and um, led me to becoming a full-time trader. But the one thing that I really had a hard time learning, the hardest thing that caused the most damage in my trading was the psychology aspect. It wasn't the indicators. It wasn't the trade rooms. You know, it wasn't any kind of formula, not even risk management, I would say. <clears throat> it was first the psychology. And that's why in the forum, there actually is a order. A lot of people don't know that we didn't just randomly number things and call them one, two, three. Sanity is the first thing that we list in the forum because no matter how good of a trading plan you have, okay, I mean, you have the perfect trade system in the world. <clears throat> and we'll just define perfect as one that has a consistent winners with decent risk reward, like ratios as far as ticks go, okay? And if you don't follow the rules, if you don't take your profits and let them run, if you don't, you know, set your stops, if you don't trail your stops, if you don't take the entries you're supposed to take based on the rules and reading the market, if you try to trade on an island, I'd say probably almost every trader is guilty of this. I want to go trade on an island. The room causes me too much confusion going into a trading room. It's so all these people asking questions. Well, hello, one of those people should be you, you know, is sort of my response. But you need to be engaged in a community. <clears throat> you have to be engaged in a community. Videos and your genius mind alone aren't gonna do it, okay? And I know it can be sometimes distracting. So you have to figure out what works best for you. But what I tell people, I had a trade the other day saying, I haven't been in the room for months, da, 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 da. We have a lot of traders that are not in the room. What really upsets me is when I say, when I see a trader not in the room and they cancel because they say it, it hasn't been working for them. And I'm like, well, we haven't heard from you for six months. So what can I do for you? How could I fix that? I had a trader today say, um, I know, you know, he's in here right now, you know, not trying to be negative. I'm, I'm trying to bring the point out that we're all guilty of this, okay? So this isn't pointing a finger. I mean, it comes right back at me too, okay? <clears throat> and he's like, man, I wish I could say I had a problem with taking profits because, you know, I've just been getting chopped up lately. And my very next question, now he was in the room, so kudos for being in the room. But my very next question was, how many charts have you posted? And with a very honest reply, he said, you know, good point. And the phrase that I use over and over on this is, you don't know, this is sort of a little phrase I came up with, but you don't know what you don't know until someone who does know sees it and tells you. Because here's what every one of us do. We watch a video, or we don't even watch a video. We just open a chart, slap an indicator on, and think we're going to figure out because we're just trading gods, right? Or goddesses. And we're just going to figure out how to make it work. Because it should just be that obvious, or else it doesn't work. And then when that didn't work, well, maybe, maybe a third of the traders will watch the videos maybe okay and um and i mean i know the stats i know every trade every video you've watched i know every course you've taken i know so i can log on i can see if somebody's even watched the videos and it's not for stalkers purposes it's so we can see how effective our videos are it's like okay this person said they weren't doing well did they take the courses no oh well okay well that one's not on us you know, it's on, I mean, I'll say it, it's on me if you're not doing well. And I'm not saying that you should go to trade live until you are doing well. But if you're not doing well, then, I mean, I want you to. So if you're taking the right steps, then what else do I need to do to help you, right? Um, 
but they watch the videos and they skim through them. Um, I had a trader the other day who, again, not one to be in the room and you know all that stuff. And I said, have you watched the video I went over last Monday about the four steps I take every time I analyze a market? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, awesome. What are they? Because he was asking questions, and his questions let me know that he hadn't watched it. Or if he had, he was skimming over it. And he said, they all have to do with volume. And I'm like, no, 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 no. And the answer is no. You skimmed through the video. You did not take notes. Right? My daughter, um, Felicity Martin, is a, and this is on topic, okay, she's a barrel racer. She is 10 years old. She started just learning to ride when she was seven and actually did her first speed event when she turned eight. Okay, and this is her this weekend. Brought in five paychecks. And the average buckle, 300 riders. Now, oh yeah, I also wanted to check, which was a surprise. Because <laughs> I wasn't trying to, I was just trying to qualify my horse for a world event. But, um, you know, here's one of her horses. This is Bodacious Hank. He's brought her, I don't know how, I want to at least seven, maybe ten world titles now. Okay, and that is just, that is a perfect barrel run. Okay, and he's been in the pasture for four months. Okay. Um, if you want to check out some of those videos, I'll post. The, uh, where is it at? I didn't always give me the top link. Anyways, it's on my Facebook page. Y'all are welcome to hop on there and me. Or friend me. Um, but <clears throat> she's a barrel racer. Now, I know riding horses. I grew up riding them all my life on my uncle's ranches and dairies. We'd spend a dozen hours on them driving hundreds of head of cattle across dozens of acres. Um, and not that I did it every day, but every time I was out there, I, you know, I, I took the chance to do it. When I got in the rodeo world, I wasn't really doing rodeo before Felicity wanted to, she's like, I'm going to go fast. I want to win titles. I'm like, okay, we got a goal. Let's go for it. And we tried everything. We tried basketball, soccer, everything else. Nothing to tell. But man, horses, she latched on. Well, I, I said, Felicity, and this is like literally the first day I bought her, like that horse right there, you just saw that it's won all that money this weekend. Um. I mean, she went about a thousand bucks and she's 10. So just not bad for two days work. And um, I said, let's see, I can get you the horses. I can get you the best tack, the best saddles, you know, the best equipment. Um, I can even get you the best trainers, you know, but you got to have the willingness to learn and listen. And you got to have the desire to succeed. Most of us have the dream to succeed. A lot of people don't have the desire, the burning, passionate desire to succeed. And that means that sometimes she's out there practicing. You know, she does homeschool this year because she wanted to ride more. And so sometimes she's out there practicing until midnight, getting up at 9 a.m. and hopping back online and doing, you know, stuff. And we're traveling all over, you know. And she literally has got to work with the best in the world, Charmaine James. If you look her up, she's won... 10, actually it's one of 11 NFR titles, 10 of them straight in a row from the age of 12 to 22. That's the highest title you can win in barrel racing. And uh, first million dollar earner in the Cowgirl Hall of Fame. And she has had the opportunity to spend time with her. You know what? We take the time, and at least me, just being the dad, the head coach, I take notes. I write down everything this lady says. Right? I've, I mean, we've worked with Fallon Teller. Probably don't, those in, out of the radio world don't know him. We've worked with Martha Josie, probably my favorite trainer overall. Just because it's very A, B, C, D. I love how she sets things up. Uh, Jackie Yachlo, uh The Burger Family, PJ Burger. Mary Burger, who's won the NFR last year. Uh, 
I mean, she's already got the best. So let's say in this room, and I'm not trying to say we're the best in the world. Just like Charmaine not be the best in the world this year, but she knows what she's talking about. I mean, would y'all agree, if, even if she hasn't won a title in the last five years, that anybody who can win a title 10 years in a row on the exact same horse, which is like unheard of because most people can't keep a good horse good for more than a few years. 10 years in a row from the age of 12 to 22 and then come back with another horse and win it again. Okay? Is there a good chance that person knows what they're talking about? Are they worth listening to? That's not a rhetorical question. So, so, yeah, don't worry about all the quality of the images. I mean, just listen. Yeah, very good chance. So good, in fact, that after my daughter took her first course with Charmin James, she stopped hitting barrels. At some barrel races, you get a five-second penalty, which is huge considering you're trying to run like depending upon how big the pattern is, because there's different sizes, he works between a 14 to an 18 second pattern, okay? So you had five seconds on, you're pretty much not making any money, okay? At this race, if you hit a barrel, it's a no time. All your money just went bye-bye, okay? So she, I mean, I think she's hit maybe half a dozen barrels in 100 runs ever since she went to that clinic. And the main focus of the clinic was how to do correct pockets so you go around the barrel at 30 plus miles per hour without slowing down and without hitting it. Okay, so is it worth listening to every video she has? All about the entry and the exit. I love it. Kelly, write that down so I remember that. <laughs> um, Exactly. It is literally about that, the injury and the exit. So, because if you don't place your horse in the right spot going in, then you're going to hit the barrel coming out. Like, it's guaranteed. I mean, that's literally, I'm like, you focus. Because what we do is we five feet out, you're five feet to the left of the barrel, three feet behind it, and one foot right next to it on the way back. Every time. Like, like that is the goal on all the barrels. 531, 531, 531. And go a little bit wide, come in tight, scraping the paint, screaming towards the next barrel. And again, yes, that's that's really all you can control. Even on that horse, that's all you can control. Now you can push them, you know, things like that. But ultimately it's about the entries and the exits. So she had to get her entry down or her exit wouldn't matter. Right? Now she also has to have her exit down, or else she'll go real wide and mess that up. But, but when we, you know, if you were going to have a doctor, you would study, 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 study. You would practice on cadavers, which are very boring, dead, also known as demo. Okay? <laughs> right? But what may, like, people go, well, demo and live aren't the same thing. I 100% agree they aren't the same thing. But you know what? When you're a doctor and you're wanting to become a doctor, you treat that cadaver like it's a live person. Because, you know, if you don't do it right here, the next person you operate on is going to be a cadaver. So what's the difference? They take it seriously, psychology. I demoed for a year before I went live. And I don't think you need to take that long at all. Like our whole goal is to speed that process up tremendously, okay? But don't discount demo. I still demo when I test new things. Like while I'm trading a system, I'm trying a new system, guess what I'm doing? I'm demoing it. I don't just, oh, I, I got to have money in the game. Okay, that's called gambling mentality, and there's a hotline number for you, okay? And if you are laughing and think that doesn't apply to you, you're the exact person we're talking about, Okay? So I'm just trying to be really, really straightforward and honest with you because anything else is going to cost you money, okay? And I'm trying to save you. Uh, I was talking to a trader the other day, and he said experience is the best teacher. I said experience is the worst teacher. What, what do you all think? 
of the best of the worst. Because you always hear experiences the best. But is it true? It, it has its place. It does. It, it often reinforces bad behavior. The school of hard knocks often leads to the death of traitors. Losing money messes you up. Yeah. Experience is the worst teacher because it is the, the meanest teacher. Okay? Wisdom is the best teacher, and that's learning from other people's mistakes. Anything I teach you, I'm not saying I'm, I've been perfect on, or that I'm still always perfect on. I'm saying I made these mistakes, and I lost a lot of money, and I learned from it. And I still have to struggle to stay on top of it to help you save that money. So you can go through the three years of hard knocks of losing money, blowing your account, saving money, coming back, losing money, blowing your account, saving money, making money, getting on a high, losing it all, blowing money. You can go through that or you can just say, you know, I'm going to learn from some people who have already been there. So because I really am, I'm not in favor of that. pain. All right. And, you know, an example of that pain, that wisdom, my daughter. Um, okay, I grew up, this is sort of funny, I grew up making fun of helmets. I mean, I think most, if you're over the age of 30, you're probably of the same mindset, okay? Like, you never wore a helmet as a kid riding a bicycle or a horse or any other kind of dangerous activity, okay? It was just... And especially if you're in the cowboy world, it's like, seriously, helmets, like, that's not cowboy enough. The first little riding school my daughter went to, I pulled her out of because they required her. They literally required her to wear a helmet. And I'm like, let's get you out of this place. This isn't real. Like, if you're going to be a cowgirl, you're not wearing a stupid helmet. Okay? Which just... on. Like, if you come from the cowboy background, that makes sense. Nobody wears helmets. Helmets are ridiculous. Okay? And now, if you're not from the cowboy world, that seems really stupid. But if you're on the cowboy world, I mean, go to any rodeo and see how many helmets are on their heads. And they're riding 1,200-pound beasts that can kill them in a second. Okay? And, you know, well, my little girl did really well. She's a great horseman. I never wore one. Never hurt me. She starts going 10 miles an hour, 20 miles an hour, 30 miles an hour, going around barrels. She gets 1,200-pound 1D. 1D means, like, really, really, really fast horses. Ones that have won, like, first place at Remington Park and things like that. And um, I start hearing some stories about some girls that have died in the past you know, year or died and survived barely um, in the past year. And then I start seeing some accidents. And uh, I'm like, you know, I might want to put a helmet on her. But how does I, as a dad, of course I can make her do it, but then when I'm not looking, she won't do it. How do I do it? And I call up an NFR writer, uh, Jackie Outslow, and she, fan, like, Felicity knows her. She knows Felicity. She's been on her maturity horse. Um, and has one of her saddles. And uh, so I contacted her on Facebook and I'm like, so I have to eat some crow because as a dad, I'm, I'm sort of about to crap myself and I need my daughter to wear, to wear a helmet. And uh, she says, I'll send her my helmet and I'll sign it if she'll promise to wear it. So I go in, I ask Felicity, I'm like, hey, I just got off the phone, Jackie. Said she'll send you her helmet and she'll put her signature on it if you promise to wear it. And uh, Felicity jumped up and down their bed. She's like, yes, 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 yes. She wore it. Two weeks later, she has a wreck on one of her horses. Uh, they didn't drag the ground properly. It was all roping dirt, and they literally just dumped her on top and didn't kill anything to me. So it was like running on concrete. But when you're walking on it as a human, it felt really deep. So everybody went 
full throttle. Okay? And um, eight people fell, not just the little 10-year-old. Okay? And she was the youngest rider there. She was running against, like, the best of the best, and, like, seven other people fell. Well, as she fell, her horse was trying to get back up and literally kicked her in the head three times with his horseshoe. Okay? You're talking about the metal, right? She's down, face in the dirt. He kicks her, flips her over. She's facing the dirt. Kicks her, flips her over her face in the dirt. Kicks her over her face in the dirt. I mean, this is this was like I'm in the alleyway trying to get through the gateman who's waiting for the horse to stop. I'm like, I don't care. I will hit the horse in the head. I'm getting to my daughter. I have friends that literally ran down and jumped over the um, wall to get down to Felicity right away. And uh, I'm flipping out. You know, I mean, every worst thought that a father can have is going through my head. And um, get down there. She has a little black eye. She's crying, you know. She's got a lot of dirt she's spitting out of her mouth. Of course, I they're like, well, I think she's okay. But and I'm like, no, we're going to the hospital now, and we're going to do a CAT scan. Um, just as they're loading her up in the ambulance, Jackie Yatla, who gave her the helmet two weeks earlier, okay? Pulls up. I was like, what's going on? Because she recognizes some of the writers and they're like, Felicity's in. She's like, did she have the helmet on I gave her? And of course, they're like, yes. They, you know, I get out. I'm crying, literally. Um, and giving her massive hugs, saying, thank you so much. Thank you so much for saving my daughter's life. We close up. We go to the amp. You know, we go to the hospital. She gets a CAT scan. Gets an all clear. The doctor's like, you know, besides that nice shiner she has, he's like, she's clear to ride. And uh, and we were only going there just for a fun little open 5Ds. We weren't even going there to hardly, like, we weren't, that was not one to win. That was one just to have fun riding against the best. And, uh, like, while we're there, she's like, do I have to ride tomorrow? I'm like, no, you don't have to do anything you don't want to do tomorrow. I was like, all you got to do is be here tomorrow and just, like, <laughs> I don't care about anything, you know. And the doctor literally said the helmet saved her life. And, um. Next day, we went out to Charmaine James, and she hopped right back on and kept riding. And has won, like I said, you know, 10 plus over 10 world titles on her different horses since then. Um, that's actually why we started a helmet company called Cherry Lid. It's Facebook.com forward slash Cherry Lid. And we designed our own helmets. We designed our own hardening. It's made out of Lego plastic, so like it's insanely hard and safe. Uh, all that to be said. Okay is experience there to wear a helmet would have been a really bad teacher. But wisdom, learning from somebody who had been there, got a concussion, then decided to wear a helmet. Okay? That's wisdom. That's a much better teacher. I would much rather us learn that a helmet's a good idea by having one on and her getting kicked. I mean, I don't ever want that to happen again. And she's never had that kind of accident again. She's bumped her head on a pole once. But, you know. I'm so glad we went the route of wisdom versus experience. That required engagement. If I wasn't engaged in the radio community. And I didn't know successful people. Who had been through pain and come out of it and figured out a better way to do it. I wouldn't have known what to do. And Felicity may or may not be here. And if she was, she would be severely impaired. You can choose to learn sanity and psychology first. Or you can go the route of hard knocks and you may or may not be here in three months, six months, a year, or three years as a trader. I know you want to make money. Trust me. We want to make money winning. Like all those checks and stuff that I showed you. She won five checks. But, but she wouldn't be making any checks if she didn't first, if we didn't first learn from the best and get engaged with them and ask questions. I had to ask. Jackie didn't just send me a helmet. It didn't just pop on my daughter's head. I had to ask. 
And I didn't even know how to do it. I was like, uh, I've been making fun of him. Like, I can, yeah, I mean, so, well, you're the dad, and she's 10, and at that time, she was nine or eight. All right, you can tell her what to do. Well, I know that, but I also, I mean, I'm also a realist. I mean, I remember being eight, nine, and 10, and Felicity's a lot better child than I was, I can tell you that. But uh, if I didn't want to do the rule, when the parents weren't looking, I didn't do the rule. And eventually, when I got old enough, if I didn't believe in it, if I didn't have a reason, and this is big, the reason. Generation X, Y, reason. I have to have a Y. I have a Y. It was going away as soon as I could. Right? So, I'm like, I have to give her a Y. And she's like, well, how about one of her favorite writers sending her a helmet that's signed? Is that a good Y? I'm like, yeah, that's a really good Y. You know, not just... Hey, it's safer. Because none of the other kids are wearing them. It's not cool. Well, you know what happened now? When we go to rodeos, and I mean, I'm not under-exaggerating at all, okay? Where'd you get that helmet? I like that helmet. I hear kids coming up to me saying, Felicity's wearing her helmet, so, and I have one, but I haven't been wearing it, but since Felicity's wearing hers, I'm going to wear mine now. I have adults saying, hey, we want a helmet like that. So it's amazing, you know, I mean, that impact that just kept going and going and going from that one writer deciding to share her wisdom. And many of the adults come up saying, yeah, I've had concussions and I think it's time to get one, you know. It's like, well, let's not go through the concussions. Let's try to, you know, if you have been going through them, let's stop going through them and learn the sanity, okay? So that being said, let's talk about a few things on sanity. I just, I'm just trying to really drill home the point. Hopefully you won't forget it with all this. So you can, these helmets will withstand a 1,200-pound horse. I wouldn't use them for motorcycle riding. They're not, like, dot-tested. But, I mean, as far as, like, skateboarding, you know, biking, they could be used for those. But they're just, these specific helmets are designed for equine sports. But they could also be used for bike riding. and Because, I mean, bike riding is a lot less impactful. It's just falling on the cement. It's not falling on the cement with a 1,200-pound horse crushing on your head with 3,000 pounds of force. You know? Um, yeah, probably. I haven't really – I could ask, ask – one of my friends who snowboards, he'll tell me because he wears helmets on everything. If you remind me later, I'll ask him. But um, but our main goal is just to get rodeo people wearing helmets because it's a very rare thing to see that in real racing. So on the top right here, we got sanity. We have psychology. A book that every one of you should read before the week is over. Remember the whole conversation we had about wisdom and experience and pain versus avoiding it? It's trading in the zone. If you have a phone, you can get this on iTunes, on Google Books, okay? You can order it on Amazon, you know, Kindle. You can buy a used one. All right, it's not expensive. And it's a lot less expensive than the hundreds of thousands of dollars of mistakes you're going to make because you didn't read that book. And when I say read it, I mean I mean chew on it like a horse or like a cow chews on grass with eight stomachs, okay? <laughs> like absorb it. Your goal is not to get from the beginning cover to the end cover. Your goal is to learn every single lesson in that book. If it takes you a couple weeks, fine. Do you have to stop trading and read it? If you're losing, I would say it's probably a good idea. Okay? Um, but at least start reading it today. Like one chapter a day, at a minimum. Okay? And take notes. It, it's, it's all about all the mistakes that we all make. And I mean, there's not a single one of you, I guarantee you, that can't identify with what's in that book. And it, the author has passed away. He passed away last year. His name is Mark Douglas. I got the fortunate chance of meeting him once or twice. Um, all the proceeds go to his wife. So I do ask, even if you find a free copy online, okay, one, report it to the website owner um, because the royalties go to his widow. So pay the 15 bucks and let the man continue to help out his wife, okay? Uh, that book is worth a lot of money. And you'll pay like 
10, maybe 20 bucks for it. If you'll get a hard copy, maybe 30 or something. Okay, maybe. But Trading in the Zone by Mark Douglas. Next topic, risk management. If you do not have proper risk management, you cannot have proper sanity. Impossible. If I overload my account where I'm staring at the profit and loss more than I'm staring at the chart, if I can't get up to go to the bathroom because I think I'm about to go broke if this thing doesn't go the tick in my right direction, if my heart is beating higher and higher every time it ticks up, then down, it goes down, and then up, it flies back up, I'm risking too much money, and your emotions will get the better of your mind. And what you will do is you will let your losses run. You will cut your profits short. Okay? And... Really, it's all in the name of greed. Like it or not, feel, I don't care what you think. It's because of greed. Because I don't want to end impatience. And we're all a little bit greedy because that's why we're traders, okay? That's why we all go out to make money because you know, we're trying to survive. I don't mean greed in the horribly bad sense. I just mean our goal is to make money. But you don't have patience, you won't survive in trading. I promise you. Okay, you have to read that book. It'll help you so much. Now, what's the formula that I like? Now, have I always followed it? No. Have I broken this? Yes. Have many times I regretted breaking it? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. And I know some of you may not have the money to follow it, but if you don't follow it, understand that you have lowered your chances of success. It doesn't mean you can't. I, mean, I know Lori who went in and basically had to break this rule. She had a hundred bucks for a binary account. And then boom, 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 made enough money, opened a futures account, and then just kept going. Okay? So are there exceptions? Yes. But you better be willing, if you're going to not follow this rule of the T, be willing to refill your account a few times. Okay? And the rule is simple. 5% divided by 6. Okay? Write down 5% divided by 6. And by the way, this is all in this whole psychology capital management section. The ideal goal is to not risk more than 5% of your account size. Now, when I say account size, I have more money in the bank account than I usually do in my trading account. Okay, that's sort of the goal, right? Um, my goal in trading was not to build my brokerage account. My goal in trading was to build my bank account. So um, I pulled out. I don't leave that much money in my trading account at all, ever. Now, if I'm ever stupid, then I have less to lose, okay? Um So 5% of my account divided by 6. Well, what does that divided by 6 mean? That's the maximum risk I should have on a trade, a single trade. So if I had a $3,000 account, what is the max risk I should have on a trade? Who can tell me? If I have a $3,000 account and I multiply that times 0.05, okay, that's 5% of my account. That's the most I'm willing to lose in a day, okay? And I divide that number by 6, that's the most in a trade. Getting a lot of different answers. So let's do it together. So let's say I have $3,000 times 0.05. Okay, 150 bucks is 5% of my account. Okay, most I'm willing to lose in a day. If you have three grand and you lose 150, can you come back tomorrow without being like mentally disturbed where you can take the next trade? Would that be possible? Are you going to be so emotionally distraught that you're like, I don't know if I should trade again? Yeah, you can come back. If you have three grand and you lose fifteen hundred, are you going to have a hard time coming back tomorrow? <laughs> you bet you are. All right. So this is about survival. 
survival of my mind so it can be clear and sane and so i can follow my rules and i can trade the charts and not my p l because you know what your p l doesn't move the chart i'm sorry but there's no reason to look at it it doesn't move the chart if you're looking at it you're it's a pretty good chance that you're uh, you're risking too much so one of my mentors taught me to actually tape, put a piece of tape over the P&L on the chart. So now you have the option to like turn them off and things like that. But if you don't over risk, that's that's okay. So twenty five bucks. Yeah, three grand in your account. The most you should be willing to risk on a trade is twenty five dollars. Is that a reality check for some of you? Now, when I say risk, I mean I don't mean put up. Like you may put up. $400 on a trade, but your risk shouldn't be more than 25, which means you should get out when it goes to $25 again. Okay, so that doesn't mean the max risk, like if you're thinking Nadex. It doesn't mean the margin if you're thinking futures, okay? It means from your, it has nothing to do with anything except for from your entry to where your stop list should be based on the chart, shouldn't cost you more than 25 bucks. You know what it what would it it would actually take I'm just gonna say it, it would take six consecutive losses for you to hit your five percent if you did that. I'm sorry, but I cannot look at a chart at all and it's hard for me to lose six times in a row. Okay, now not on a binary, not a twenty five dollar binary, yeah, you could lose like all day, but I mean even on that's a that's a 25% chance of winning. <laughs> 25 is what a binary represents. So now maybe you have to risk a little more, whatever, but ideally right around 25 bucks, okay? Now, does that mean the most I can make is 25 bucks a trade? No, that doesn't mean there's a cap on how much I could make. I could make $300 on the trade. Okay? And again, that doesn't mean that my max risk has to be 25. It just means I need to be willing to get out when it goes down 25. Now, next question. Does that mean that my stop loss should be 25 ticks below where I enter? And that's that's how I should choose my stop loss. 100% no. Very good. So get some, y'all been listening. So my stop loss should be based on the chart. So, so if that stop loss is greater than 25 bucks on your, say, $3,000 account, then you have a few choices. One, you can learn to hedge. Like I got hot the other day. I, mean, I was trading a full oil contract with 40 bucks of risk. Yeah, we brought home a nice chunk of change, right? Y'all saw the trade live. We did it, started it on the in the trading room, and started it on the radio show and ended it in the trading room. So you can learn to hedge. You can use a smaller tick size version of that same instrument. Like you could go from NASDAQ at $20 a point, you know, to NASDAQ spreads at $10 a point. I'm not talking ticks. I'm talking about like a one-point move. Um, you could go with a, you know, I mean, like silver and copper is even lower, like as far as move, because like you have to have like 50 silver contracts on NEDX to go one silver future. So if you want to go with really low risk on movement, you're not going to make a lot, but you're not going to lose a lot. Keep things in check. You can go with the Forks Mini account. Okay. Um, hedging, I think, is the best way, personally. Um, the answer is not $25 binaries. <laughs> okay. So if you're thinking that, I know so many people come in and they love binaries. They want to learn binaries, but it's like, man, it's all, it's so probability based. It's all statistics. If you're trading at Delta, it's all, I mean, I make money trading it, you know, every week just about, but, um, it took me a long time to get there. Like you're choosing the harder road for no real good benefit. Um, so 
you have to make a choice if your stops are too big based on the chart for your risk management you are going to have to choose to be a bad trader or to change something such as adding in hedges which may or may not work depending upon the you know specific strategy you're doing like you don't hedge for scalps unless you're like really trying just to play around oscillation lines all day that's a whole different topic um or go down to a lower tick size version of that instrument or go to a different instrument altogether you know es is 50 bucks a point ten dollars a point on nadex you can drop it down a what So, I mean, I just, I bring this up. By the way, I started with $3,000 in my account. Actually, I retook it from my wife's teacher retirement account. And apparently it worked because now she's retired. But um, you don't have to have 3000 You may have 500 you may have 100 you may have 10 grand, you may have 20 grand, whatever. Um, but what you have to have is risk management. And that management, that keeps you in check as your account grows because then your position can grow. If the risk is 25, let's just say $25 on this trade, just throwing a number up, and you have $6,000, then you can do two contracts. So as soon as you know what you can risk on the trade, based on the stop and based on your account size, you know your position size. Okay? Does that, that help? That actually gets you into correct position sizing. I'll get into hedging in a little bit. Does everything make sense so far? I know this isn't like one of those webinars where you hear what you want. But it's one of those webinars where you really hear what you need. Are y'all getting anything out of this? I'm getting a lot of yeses. That's good. I hope so. Because like this is, these are lessons from a lot of pain. <laughs> my pain and the pain of others. Um, I remember my my mentors. I mean, I got to learn from Tom Sajnoff some. I got to learn from John Netto, Joey Geo. I mean, I got, you know, uh, my work, Rob Ross. And, you know, there's, there's a multiple, there's several trade, you know, Tom, Tommy O'Brien other guys, but the number one lesson that Neto drilled into my head, and me and Neto don't really trade much alike at all. We have our own ways of doing things, but we totally agree on markets. And um, Is risk management, I mean, the, the golden key, everybody wants, everybody wants to find out, you know, the holy grail to trading. The holy grail is starting out with the right mindset, I'm here to become a good trader, to trade well. Okay, because without that, nothing works. If I'm here to simply make money, it doesn't work. We've all seen um, Toby Maguire, right? Everybody seen Toby Maguire? I've been a long time. No, the help me help you. <laughs> Cuba Gooding Jr. Tom Cruise. You had me at hello. Remember those quotes? That movie? Maybe I'm quoting the wrong name. Oh, Jerry Maguire. I'm sorry. Jerry Maguire. It's a Maguire. <laughs> Everybody's seen that, right? He was all like, show me the money. And Tom Cruise was, go, go out and play like you did when you were in high school. And have fun. And I'll show you the money. Go to play the game. Play to play well. Don't play for the dollars. Okay? And this is, trading is sort of like that. You got to love the game. If you don't, you're not going to do well. 
If it's pure money oriented, you're going to be watching the score clock. I mean, how many teams do you think win staring at the score clock? I don't care if it's basketball or soccer or football or anything else. You don't go to the Super Bowl by watching the score clock. You know, the scoreboard. Can't use the right words today. Scoreboard. Throughout the game. You go by doing the best play you can do right now, what's in front of you, and doing it to the best of your ability. That's why I'm, re say, reading trading in the zone. Use proper risk management. And a can't. Either one, save money up and keep learning and keep practicing. Is there value? Because some people go, well, I'll wait until I make the $3,000, then I'll join, pay the $200, and da-da-da-da, and all that stuff. Is there value to being in this room and trading for a few months before you actually throw live cash? To coming in here and getting it down? Yeah, it's called an education, right? We pay for an education everywhere else. Now, our education is free, but it's a whole different thing when you got it on the charts, you're clicking buttons. You should expect, you should, I, should, I would hope you'd almost want to not go live right out of the gate. I know you want the money yesterday. I know a lot of you need the money yesterday. I feel you, okay? I didn't come with a silver spoon in my mouth at all, by any means. Dad is a drug addict. And I, also, I can tell you all sorts of crazy stories, okay? I know you need the money. But needing the money is a good way for the market to take it from you. And what I tell people is if you can't sit down and trade for at least a month following the systematic rules, and following risk management guidelines with what you're going to fund with and end up with net profitability. If you can't do that, you're not going to have the discipline to do it right when you are funding with a live account. Now, Lair makes a good point. The most successful people in the world never focus on the money. They focus on their passion. And from that, the money comes. So if you're having a hard time, pay a couple hundred bucks a month, be involved and engaged in the room, place trades, ask questions. It's a lot cheaper than throwing live cash at the market, the experience method of getting kicked in the head. It makes a lot of sense. And yes, you know, you can watch all the courses free and you can do a lot of stuff free and I'm all for that, getting past that basics. But I mean, literally, I mean, tell me a college that you can go to where you can learn how to make six figures a year potentially that costs 2400 bucks a year. Or right now, the promotion of, you know, that ends tonight, $1,350. $1, $1,350 for a year of guidance and mentoring and education and tools and Tell me anywhere you can go and work from home and not have a boss and not have to buy and sell product to people and all your friends. Tell me where you can go and accomplish that. Most people don't expect to make money on a trade until they're out of trade school. Right? Maybe they get a little bit of an apprentice fee when they're going around and helping. But I mean, I've had people come in and out of the gate make money. And I've had people take a year or two. You know, it all depends on where somebody's starting from, how fast they pick things up. Okay? But I just, I really want you to get the idea of we got to get your sanity right. We got to get your expectations in line. And we got to get your risk management in check. And then once you get your risk management in check, the next thing you need in check is your profit management. Okay? Now, when I was, I don't know, I was probably, probably about Felicity's age 10, and I'd ride around with my grandpa. He had a, uh, he went to cattle barns, and he bought cattle, and then he had his own truck, and he would haul them to slaughterhouses and sell them. And, um, so I actually grew up around the futures market, per se. And... He had his own little niche it's called the Evans Five. Basically, he knew what would pass inspection and what wouldn't. So, like, if they had, like, a, it's called an Evans Five because my grandfather's last name is Evans. And uh, basically, like, if it had a bloody eye or something, I mean, he knew 
what would pass inspection. And a lot of guys wouldn't bid on those because they didn't know what would pass. And if you show up with a cow that didn't pass inspection, you know what? They don't buy it from you. Now you're stuck with a cow that you just spent 500, 800 bucks on, whatever they pay for cows. And um, sort of hope. Okay. So buy it with that edge. You can buy it a little cheaper and make more money because he didn't have everybody bidding against him. And so I'd go out with them to, you know, all these different auction sales, do all these different things. And while I was doing this, he taught me how to play blackjack. <laughs> and one of the traders in here said they actually play poker for a living uh, professionally. That's actually how you know they make their living. They go in, and once they make their profit, they walk away for the day, no matter what. Like they don't matter if it takes them four hours or if it takes them thirty minutes. They walk in, they play poker, they walk out. So, and I imagine they've done that because they've learned that if they keep staying, they give it back. Same thing in trading. You keep trading, you're going to give it back. So you have to have a plan of how do I not give it back? Well, the lesson he taught me when uh, for playing blackjack was he said, hey, when I go play blackjack, because he likes to go to Vegas sometimes a year, and he said, when I play blackjack, what I do is every time I win, he's like, I take half and I put it in my pocket. And the other half I can, you know, keep playing with. He's like, when I'm out of money on the table, I walk away. He's like, the nice thing about that is, he's like, usually I walk away with some profit. He got free drinks, which was cool. <laughs> and, um, you know, but he's like, there's nothing worse than walking away from a table empty-handed. And so he said, if you want to do that, you can at least enjoy the entertainment, and you might actually make some money while you're at it. Okay? So that, that was sort of, you know, the way he looked at doing it. And I you pretty much do the same thing when I go play uh, – Blackjack, or when I play roulette, or when I play craps in Vegas and have some fun with fun money, because I, you know, purely fun money. I am not a professional. Um, and so, how do we take that? How do we apply that? Okay, to trading, and then take it maybe a step further. Okay, my first rule on taking profits: if I want to talk about it. If I made some money and I want to tell you about the money I made, I have to withdraw it. All of it. Okay? Real simple rule. One, that keeps your ego in check. Because it shouldn't be about you getting all excited and wanting to tell everybody in the world about you making money. But it's okay. If I tell my wife, hey, man, I just made a thousand bucks. You know what my next step is? My account, funds, withdraw, <laughs> okay? If you want to talk about it, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your kids, your family, trading room, your Facebook followers, your Instagram people, withdraw it. One, you got into trading to get paid. True or false? You're, you're trading to make money. True or false? I mean, hopefully you have a deeper reason than that, but the reason you're sitting down and choosing to make it in this way is because you want to make you know, money for some purpose. So pay yourself. I'm so amazed that how many traders have never withdrawn money. Oh, by the way, first time you win, or profit, I guess, if you don't want to make it like gambling, okay? First time you profit, withdraw it. Just see what happens when you get to see that money. I don't care if you ACH it or wire it or whatever. But when you see the money come into your bank account from your trading account, that's addictive. Okay, that's uh, you get more addicted to wanting to withdraw than you do to wanting to win, which means. You want to trade well, so you can make withdrawals. First time you make real money, withdraw that money. Take a picture of it. Frame it. You know, when it hits your account. Go brag about that one to your spouse. 
and let them see you actually pulled something out of the market. Okay. Other rule. No matter what, every week, let's say you started, and I'm just throwing in a breath. Let's say we start with 10 grand. Let's say you're at 20 grand at the end of the week. Take out half. Let's say you started with $500 and you're at $600. Take out half. And I say half, I mean half of your profits. So if you start with 500 and you had 600 at the end of the week, take out how much? Fifty bucks. It's not a fortune, but can you take your spouse to dinner on that? Let them you need a spouse that's more supportive of your trading bad habit. They think maybe saying um, this just got paid for by my trading. That might help. Go buy your kid a toy. Go buy yourself a toy. Okay? Spend it. You know, and I have a whole other way of, you know, like read the richest man in Babylon that'll help you learn a little bit better. I, I recommend adding a first ten percent you give to someone in need or a church. If you're not part of a church, then give to someone or an organization. It's the one piece that the richest man in Babylon doesn't have is that giving the first 10% to somebody. Like be, it shows that you're grateful and it puts you in perspective. And I told my daughter that. I'm like, when you cash all these checks, what are you going to do? She's like, take 10% and I'm going to give it. I'm like, yes, always keep that thankful attitude for what you get. And I'm not like suggesting, like I'm telling you, like you need to do this stuff. Okay? Now, what about during the day? If I'm up at 5% and I close a trade, I'm done. Okay? Um, now, what if I'm up 7% when I close the trade? Now I get two choices. I can risk the 2% above my 5%, or I can just go flat. Neither one is a bad choice. Sometimes those 2% end up into 20%, 50%. I've even had 100% days. Literally double in my account. Okay? Always protect your profits. When you hit that 5%, don't ever give it back. And I honestly think it's not a bad thing to hit withdraw every day when you hit it, okay? But I do withdrawals. I try to do it. I probably do two to five withdrawals a week. Sometimes I do like 10. Sometimes I do several a day because I'll like just nail several trades. I'll make a lot. I'm like, I'll take that, and then I'll take that, and I'll take that, you know. You are here to withdraw money. <laughs> that is your goal. It's also here. That's how you pay for your membership to keep learning, right? How, I mean, the, really, it's how you pay your bills and for fun and everything else. Like, it's so amazing. I mean, people never think about it. I've had people trade. I've been trading for two years. And I've never done a withdrawal. How do you do that? You know? It's like, man, that should have been done like the first time you ever hit a profit just so you could feel it and know it. But one, just to know how to do it. People go, well, I want to grow my account as fast as possible. So that's why I don't want to withdraw money because I'm compounding is the game. Again, just like if you stay trading all day long, you're going to give it back. If you just leave your money in, you're going to give it back. You know, why do you think they give you poker chips and not money? Doesn't feel as real. If you just stay there with the poker chips, eventually, not poker, but other games, whatever. I mean, even poker, but eventually... You know, even when you go to now you go to slot machines, you're not even putting in quarters anymore. Now it's all like swipe your card, right? That's how you don't have to pull the lever. You know, just touch a button, touch a button, touch a button. You know, withdraw, cash out. You have to. 
Because it ain't real until it's in your bank. I mean, it's a real win and it's a real loss. Whether it's an open trade or it's a closed trade, it's real money made and real money lost. But it ain't real, real profit until it's in your account. All right, another trader, Joseph. Uh, when I play poker to make money, I have to hand them cash to buy chips, 200 bucks. Then they look down, and I see I have 500 and more in front of me, and I go to the cage and cash it out. Next time I go to play, I hand them cash to play again. If I lose, I have to hand them another 200. So each time you're handing them money, it is not a good thing. I think of trading the same. If you got a deposit, if you deposit $2,000 and I made 1000 in a week, I withdraw the 1000 If you find that you're having to put more in the next week, it's a good way to check yourself a heads up first. So, like, did you do anything wrong? So now the reason I do leave in, I say, like, you know, if you make, at the end of the week, take out half, is because it allows you to grow your account. Okay? So you can make more to get to the point because I have a goal of making a hundred dollars a day or five hundred dollars a day or a thousand dollars a day. I'm like, why don't you just first have the goal of trading well and then have the goal of profiting net at the end of a month or a week or a day. Do that, the dollars will come. Let your account account compound, it will get massive. Okay. And you'll make whatever amount you want because it's just a matter of size of contract, not number of trades you use. Okay, so patience. I know you want to make a fortune today, but that's a fast way to lose all your trading capital. Mind has to be in check. Risk management has to be in check. Profit management has to be in check. If your risk management is in check, you will not follow your system. You will change it up on a consistent basis. Sanity also has to do with one last piece that I'm going to close up with on this section, and that's ego. If you are here, if you're trading to look good, you're trading. Trading to lose. Okay? If you want to look good in front of your family or your wife or your kids or your Facebook people or the people in this room, you're going to lose. The lawyer herself, which I think everybody in here would agree is a great trader, she posted a chart yesterday. I mean, she only was up net two ticks. And we, she posted her chart, found a couple things, helped make her a better trader. She don't care about looking good. She cares about making mistakes. Post your charts. Ask for help. And by the way, as you're learning, offer help. I can tell you in trading, I have become a lot better trader by helping other traders. I became a lot better trader by helping other traders. Yeah, Lori, I mean, skyrocketed when she hopped in and actually started like getting really involved in the main. First, she asked me a thousand questions, which was perfectly fine. Then she asked me like five thousand more, which was still okay. <laughs> but I mean, she knew like she was like, "What is bid offer spread?" I mean, she started at the very beginning. Okay, that's just like three years ago. And then the more you help other people, like you really have to have it down to explain it. And don't be afraid to tell them wrong because somebody in here will correct you, okay? It's okay to be corrected. I like to be corrected. It means that I won't have the false assumption again. Yeah, I mean, don't, you know, you know I'm, I'm a Christian and all that, you know, but you know the whole like, Stereotype of people paying church on Sunday and not in between. And I'm not saying I'm perfect. That's the whole point of being a Christian. It's a very lack 
I lack imperfection in many ways, obviously. But I got to be honest about that or it doesn't do me any good. Right? Well, I'm not preaching to anybody. I'm telling you about my life. Trading? You got to be honest. Give me feedback. Tell me where I can improve. Search my trades. Search my charts. So, embrace correction. Be engaged in the room. And if you're like, well, there's nobody in here. Well, then why don't you start being the person that is in here at that time of day? And others will follow. And then ask for help on the side. <laughs> and she'd talk it out. And I'd go back and I could actually look at some of your stuff. But, I mean, maybe you trade the Euro session in the morning. Maybe you trade early in the morning before you go to work, before we get going. Maybe you trade at night. That's the only time you can, you know. And, by the way, there's going to be a little bit different times of trading. So the questions, I may answer questions that work really well in the morning that may not work as well in the evening, you know, that type of thing. Scary when Lori would argue with herself. Lori's scary, you know, most times. But, uh, <laughs> but you, just, you have to be engaged as a trader. You stop being on an island. Stop saying I'll hop in the room because there's somebody special going to be there. Like, oh, Daryl, I'll be there today. I'm glad you're here. I really am glad you're here. And I hope you're learning a whole lot. But, I mean, share your charts. And don't just share the bad ones. Oh, that's my annoyance, right? Like, oh, this one lost. Why? This one lost. Well, sometimes they lose, okay? <laughs> share the chart. Like, if you took one trade for the day, that's why you lost, all right? <laughs> like, share the chart. At least mark it up if you didn't trade it. Like, saying, okay, here's where I would have taken entry. Here's where I would have taken exit. Here's why. You know, on this one, I took this one, it lost. Is there anything I could have improved on? When we see what you're doing right, we can reinforce it, okay? Which is what you really want. You want the right part being reinforced, and you want the wrong part being corrected. So you need to post the good and the bad. And it's not just so we can, you know, say, hey, look, this person made money. Okay, I mean, I, I make enough. I'm not really worried about whether or not you subscribe, I mean, I hope you do, personally. As a person, I hope you do. But I'll be okay. I I can live on my trading. All right? You need to have the right things you're doing reinforced, and you need to have the wrong things fixed. It's amazing how many times I've had people go, I've been trying this for two or three months, and it just keeps hitting me. And I cannot, I mean, I, I literally can't tell you the number of times where it was like one mistake made over and over and over and over and over again. And they want and they'd watched the course four times. They'd read every forum post that existed. They'd been in the room. But they'd never posted their charts. So they didn't know that one false assumption. I can't teach to a million people's false assumptions or to a hundred people's false assumptions. Unless I know what the false assumption is. Then we can correct it. But there's no way to know what you might be assuming inaccurately. And you think you know it. Unless somebody who knows sees it. And there's all, if you just search, and Kelly, maybe you can post the link, how to share charts. But uh, I mean, I just, I hope. I don't know if 10 of you are going to like take this home or I don't know 50 or I don't or the hundreds that listen afterwards but man if you're involved in the room we're here to not just give I mean it's you're going to learn so much from videos and so much from forums but at a certain point if you're not engaged with the professors and the other students you are limiting your learning. Would you all agree that probably applies to any kind of trade? You can learn so much from books. 
But at a certain point, asking professors or those that have been there done that, and those that are learning it, is going to really be the big difference maker. I mean, all that other stuff gives you the vernacular, the you know, the vocabulary, the ability to see what we're talking about and know. When I say, hey, when you see the trend catch line on the trend flip, and you got you know your expected volume exceeding, and your VAT over here is doing a divergence. Those videos help you know what we're talking about. But for you to fully embrace it, own it, understand it, that requires being in the room, asking questions, asking questions in the forum, and posting marked up charts. I mean, we should see a marked up chart constantly by everybody. If you're not posting at least three a week, you're hurting yourself. It's like never turning in your homework and then going to the final exam and wondering why you didn't pass. When if you would have turned your homework in, you would have found out all the things you messed up on and could have corrected before the final exam came up. And the final exam, by the way, is when you hit that live money button. <laughs> I had a great teacher. Um, I was a horrible writer. Like, I mean, I couldn't write at all. Um, I'm still horrible at grammar, but I can write pretty well. And I had a great English teacher in college, finally, because I hated English. Uh, like, I mean, I despised it because I like logic, you know, there's all these if-then rules. Yeah. Spelling. I know how to spell. I just type fast and I don't care and go back to check it. It's, it's, that's more laziness, honestly. But, yeah. Um, what she let us do is really cool. She actually let us turn in our papers. She would grade them. And then we could correct it and she'd regrade them. We could turn them in all year long, the same paper. And she'd, she'd fix the grade. So if we fix that and fix it, she'd fix it. I mean, we could, there's no reason not to get 100 in her class. Like, it's your fault if you don't get 100 in her class. Now, when she graded it again, she would, you know, get even more harsh each time. So she could help teach you more and more. And I rewrote, like, 20 papers probably half a dozen times at least. But I learned how to write for the first time in my life. But I, if I would not have... You know what most students do? They take that paper and they throw it in their backpack and it ends up in the trash. They never looked at all the things to fix. What you know, all the little red markings. Like, ah, I got this grade. I stopped, looked at it, and you know, honestly, I probably would have done the same thing, except this English teacher was smart enough to get me to go back and fix it. So I'd actually learn and not just make the same mistake paper after paper after paper. So her name is Dr. Snyder, and she's awesome. She does a lot of mission work in Ghana also on during summer breaks and stuff. And um, I don't know if she's still teaching or not, but I mean, like after her, I actually ended up graduating top of my class. I got second. Uh, I was salutatorian. The only person that beat me, barely beat me, and they took five years instead of four to graduate. And like I was a top third of my class student. Mainly because I never cared, but she taught me how to care and pay attention. And I mean, it just, but it was about going back and looking at that marked up chart and fixing it. So post your marked up charts. I've probably said it 45 times. Hopefully the lesson has stuck. All right. Sanity, stewardship, engagement. Okay.